The Westwood One Podcast Network. All right, everybody, welcome back to the TNQ Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Luttrell. Every week, it's my job to fire you up, to ignite the legend inside of you, and to push you to your greatness. Join me every week as I take you into my briefing room with some of the most hard-charging people on the planet. They're going to show you how to embrace the suck of life, teach you the values of working your ass off, and charge through whatever life throws at you. This is the Team Never Quit Podcast. Podcast. So buckle up, buttercup. The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. Navy Federal Credit Union has a mission to put members first by making their financial goals the priority. Learn more at NavyFederal.org and join today. What up, what up? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. My name's Andrew, joined by Marcus and Melanie Luttrell. Hey guys, welcome back. Going on, brother. Good to be back. Hello. I'm so glad you're out here with me, bud. (laughs) I'm glad to be here. We've got an awesome Really special guest today, Ryan Mannion, president of the Travis Mannion Foundation and sister of Lieutenant Travis Mannion, United States Marine Corps, who made the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq. And we're we're so excited for her to share her story about her new book, all that she's got going on with the foundation, and just it was awesome to hear her story. So we 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 can't wait for you guys to hear that. Before we do, we got a Patreon question. Mackenzie asks if you could choose any other occupation, what would you choose? Hmm. I know what I would be. All right. I would like work for the FBI or something and be some sort of um oh what's that show I like, babe? Profiler. Yeah, I'd be a profiler. Be a, you are mm-hmm. one. Yep, that's what, I would you are what you're talking about. But I want to get paid for it. There's a new show right now called The Prodigal Son on Fox and it's all about this profiler guy. Oh, really? It was a really interesting show. I, I was say, I'm a frog man and you're married. I mean, you profile, <laughs> I get profiled every day by you. I did, pro- I profile you. Yeah. That's definitely what I would want to do. Like a real thing. Mm-hmm. And I've been trained to be sneaky squirrel and trying to keep, and it's, <laughs> to be sneaky. Yeah. And, and no. By the way, he's never pulled anything, anything off on not me. Not one thing. <laughs> and I've pulled off several surprises for him. It's like this wall, this barrier. <laughs> I can't see through it, man. It's just there was the birthday what video you, surprise that one there? year. That's a, um, I've surprised him every year, oh. literally every year. I would, I would have liked to have been a baseball player. Yeah, Verlander, Marcus wants to sub in for you. Yeah, we ran into him the other day at the football game. Oh wait, wait, or a professional golfer. Scenery is always good. Ain't nobody trying to k- hit you or kill you. I would stand by your side on either one of those. See, golf, you got to play by yourself. I mean, you got you and your caddy, but <laughs> yeah. that, that's why I'm in, in baseball. I have to be a baseball player. I can sing and play guitar, but not good enough to be famous at it. But that would have been cool to be a famous right musician. Well, I wouldn't be famous. What are you talking about? You can do that now. Lo- I can do guitar on a wall. I can Grab be locally famous. I can be, I can be famous in these walls. You could play in Tomball. You are famous in these walls. <laughs> Mackenzie, thanks for your question. If you want to ask your question on the podcast, just send it to us on Patreon. You can join us there, patreon.com slash teamneverquit. We actually started Patreon so that we could give our listeners a community just for them. We actually do live Q&As. We send out videos that are personalized from Marcus. We send out some really cool swag. If you want to join us there, it's patreon.com slash teamneverquit. Let's get to that interview with Ryan. We are sponsored by Lightstream. The holidays are in the rearview mirror, and if you're starting the new year with high interest credit card debt, here's an easy way to put some money back in your pocket. All right, if you got credit card debt, you're trying to pay it off. If you're young, you're in college, just out of college, and everything like that, like we've all been, and you need to consolidate that, do it here at Lightstream. It's one of our sponsors. You can save thousands in interest, get a fixed rate from low as 5.95% APR with AutoPay. Lightstream loans have no fees. The online application is quick and easy, and you can apply right from your phone. Lightstream believes that when you get good credit, you deserve a low rate and great service, and that's exactly what they deliver. And Lightstream has a special deal for our listeners, and if you apply now, they're going to give you an additional interest rate discount. Only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash TNQ. That's lightstream.com slash TNQ for an additional discount. L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash TNQ. 
though you'll be subject to credit approval. Rates include 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com forward slash TNQ for more information. I am Ryan Mannion. I'm the president of the Travis Mannion Foundation, which is a national veteran serving organization that was founded after the death of my brother, First Lieutenant Travis Mannion. He was killed in Iraq, uh, April 29, 2007. I am also the daughter of a retired Marine Corps colonel, so grew up in a military family. Um, and I always say that, you know, growing up in a military family, I certainly recognized um, the idea of service from a very young age, but it really wasn't until my brother was killed that I understood what sacrifice meant. And um, I think I was a little bit naive to that side of things. Um, but, you know, it's really propelled me to make sure that I'm bringing awareness to the military community, to the um, incredible assets that our men and women who serve can bring to the larger community at home. And um, outside of that, I'm a married mother of three children, ages 13, 10, and five. And, um, you know, just love traveling around and sharing um, my story and um, just newly released uh, a book with uh, two other gold star widows uh, called The Knock at the Door. And um, really just sharing our story about our loss and what, what happened after that. Awesome. Oh, yeah. We, we, uh, we got a copy of the book. Thank you for that. And um... I cried. It's so sad. <laughs> it's really good. It's really well written. Thank Gr you. Growing up in a house full of Marines, we know you're tough. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, my dad did 11 years active duty, did 19 years in the reserves. Um, and, you know, he's very he, he he retired in 2008, actually, after my brother was killed. But he said, you know, he always says I did less in my 30 years of service than than guys like you and my brother that they did in, you know, just a few short years. Um, you know, this generation post 9-11 has been challenged in so many different ways. And um, it's just so important to share their stories. I've heard some of those guys say that, too. And, you know, when you're in and you're young, you don't you kind of hear that. and You're like, yeah, well, OK, all right. But when you get out, you realize that the, even though there's a gap in between those battles, they're still having to hold that gap and hold it all together and keep that cohesive unit. So when a war, when it drops in on you like ours did, if, if they weren't as squared away as they were, then we wouldn't be as productive as we were. And, yeah. and that's kind of how I've always looked at it. And, and like I said, when you're young, you don't. You're just like, hey, whatever, you know, Colonel, I don't need to wear Air Pro. I'll heal, I can hear forever. <laughs> All the pieces of advice that they give you, if you're, if you're dealing with somebody who's been in the military or, or you got a, a military dad, when they tell you something, it's, it's usually for a reason. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I definitely was not um, – I always kind of fought the uh, military dad. I, you know, I was – I was a little bit of the wild child. I was kind of always bucking the system. Um, so it's interesting now to kind of come full circle and and look back at um, the lessons that he was teaching me along the way. I, I finally have started to respond to some um, now that I'm getting older. Right. Oh, yeah. In the beginning, you know, I mean, you, know, you can't even pay attention to yourself, much less what's going on. And in, in that I didn't I, I didn't hear. But did you marry a Marine? I did not. No, um, I, I married a, a surfer from New Jersey. Because okay, so. okay. I've always heard that I was either either you marry a Marine or you don't. Yeah, like, I went the complete opposite. Yeah, direction. The complete opposite, right? And he's like, not Marine. <laughs> so I read that you and Travis were 15 months apart, and that is the age difference between our little ones. So it struck me because I know just at seven and eight how close they are. I mean, they. They fight with each other, but they love each other more than anything. So so can you start off by just telling us about you and Travis growing up and your relationship and then get into that? Uh, tell us about your brother. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we were um, – Travis and I were 15 months apart. We were born in Camp Lejeune. Um, and, you know, I always say that um, we moved for every two years for the first, you know – 12 years of my life. And so those formidable years when I was a child, 
I was moving every two years into a new situation, having to acclimate with new kids, new school, new sports teams. And um, having a brother that close in age, it was like I always knew that I had my built in best friend coming with me. Um, And really, you know, we I always say we fought like normal brothers and sisters fight. But once we hit high school, we were best friends. It was really cool to have him with me um, through those years. And, um, you know, he was the guy that I would say, uh, hey, my my friend doesn't have a date to prom and you're taking her. And he'd always be the one to say, all, all right, I'll go. And, oh, yeah, that's a wingman. All right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was he was a great wingman. And, um, you know, we were very different, though. So. Um, in, in the respect that Travis was very driven from a young age, he was always working towards goals, even as a 11 year old, 12 year old, he was setting goals and he very much admired my dad and my dad's service and what he was all about. And I was a little bit more carefree. Um, but I loved watching him develop. And even at that time, I recognized that the way he was, was a little bit different And now looking back at it, I I marvel at the things that um, he set in in his sights, you know, as a a high school student. Um, He was always driving towards that next goal. And it's it's pretty incredible to see now and raising my own kids. I have a 13 year old and, you know, you you kind of watch for that light switch to, to turn on, you know. Oh yeah, because we have we got a pretty good spread between our oldest boy and then the next two, but th- those two are close. Just like we said, yeah, we have a twenty-one year old in college, and then the seven and eight year old. And she's just like uh, you described. Uh, you our and little Travis girl yeah, is she's carefree, just like that. You know, yeah, loves to paint and, and just happy, <laughs> happy walking her outside chasing butterflies, right? <laughs> and then my and then Axe is he's uh, a rule follower and very strategic and. Yeah, he sounds a lot like Travis. It's I like seeing patterns of how siblings grow up, especially in that uh, with that age. It's a close age gap, so I love to keep in touch. So if I see anything, in- I'll be like, "Hey, what, 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 what does this mean? What's what's happening here?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I was reading in the book about when you learned about Travis, um, and at first you thought that there was something wrong with your daughter, which. I couldn't imagine having that feeling too. Can you tell us, tell the listeners a little bit about that, that haven't read the book yet? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, on the day Travis was killed, I actually was living in New Jersey. I, I was a small business owner, I owned a clothing boutique, and I was about to open up my second location outside of Philadelphia, uh, where my parents lived. And, um, I had come up for the day with my 10 month old daughter and, That morning, it was beautiful. My mom had just decided to throw an impromptu barbecue at our house, uh, at their house. So we had close to 30 people in our house at the time. And I had run up the street to sign the lease on my new location. And I was standing there with the landlord and uh, my cell phone rang. I looked down, I saw it was my mom. And I just, you know, I ignored it. I kept going, doing what I was doing. And right away, the phone rang again. And I'm like, she's not calling me two times in a row if she doesn't have something she needs to talk to me about. So I answered the phone. And um, when I did, I just heard screaming on the other end of the line. And I just kept saying, what happened? What happened? And it was just screaming. They come home, come home. And my thoughts immediately went to my daughter, Maggie. Um, I thought something had happened to her. All I could think was, you know, I'm a brand new mom. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she choked or she fell and hit her head. And so I said, did someone call the ambulance? And the voice on the other end of the line said, yes. And the phone went dead. So I was about a mile away from my house. I was with my business partner at the time. And I said, I can't drive. Something happened to my daughter. You have to take me home. So she drove me that mile to um, my parents' house. I uh, felt like it took 10 hours to get there. And when I pulled up into, um, I pulled onto the road, I jumped out of the car and my dad was standing in the driveway with one of his friends who was a um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps. And I was, it, it was like total confusion. Cause I'm, I'm thinking what, what, why are they standing in the driveway? And I just looked at my dad and I said, did you call an ambulance? And my dad looked at me with like a puzzled look on his face. And he just said, Travis was killed. 
And obviously that's the most shocking news you're going to get, but it was so the, the shift in my emotions was so crazy because the whole time I thought something had happened to my daughter to, to just hear those words. And, you know, I talk a lot, um, about when Travis was in Iraq, this was his second deployment. He deployed originally as a logistician with the Marine Corps, did a first deployment for, um, with, as a logistics officer, and then came back a little bit unnerved that he didn't have really feel like he was in the fight. So he, he went and joined first recon with the Marine Corps and deployed his second time as a part of a MIT team. So he was just one of 12 Marines attached to the Iraqi army, helping to train him. And I knew that that deployment was going to be different. Um, my husband had actually shared that with me because when Travis was first deployed, if I emailed him, he responded within 24 hours. Um, and he would constantly, when I would talk to him on the phone, he would actually say that he was bored. And I was like, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> that's what I you want to hear as a sister. Yeah. That's well, I great. always told mom that. Yeah. Nothing, nothing <laughs> going on out here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, so when he went back a second time, communications were very limited. Um, and, but I, I was naive to the fact, and I think it was probably a defense mechanism for myself, but I knew that men and women were giving their lives in Iraq. Um, I saw it on the news, but I also had this, you know, it's my brother, nothing's going to happen to him. There's how many thousands of men and women over there? Um, it's not going to be my brother. And so to hear those words from my dad, it was, it was so shocking. And, um, you know, to be in that moment with, uh, I say it was a blessing and a curse. You know, we had all these people at our house. So immediately we had people there. We, we were all together, mourning together, but it was also a very chaotic scene. And, um, you know, it's, it's one that I'll never forget. Of course. Can't imagine that. We've been in kind of a similar situation and it's hard to, I, and I didn't even think about it till you said something, but going from where you think that it's your daughter to where it's your, and having that pit to where it's your brother kind of deal. Yeah. It's, it's different, but it's the yeah. same, right? Sure. I mean, it's kind of like going through both of those. I mean, you literally go down both those rabbit holes together. I mean, right after the other, if it's anybody right. close to you. And when there's, um, with us, there was, there was 20 of us. So everybody had to go through all of that. And it's truly lets you, what well, lets you know what you love and what you don't and what, what you appreciate and, and how fragile everything is. Yeah, absolutely. So what was the following months like after that? What, how did you start the foundation and what got you going in that direction? Well, you know, one of the things that happened, it was actually the day of Travis's funeral. Um, of course, you know, the first few days are just, it's, it's shock and it's planning because mm -hmm. right away you've got a Keiko officer that says we need to, we need to put all this together. And so imagine planning in a, a huge event when you're suffering the greatest loss you could ever imagine. Right. And, um, but it was the day of Travis's funeral. My dad pulled my mom and my husband and I into their bedroom. And he said, listen, you know, I don't know what happens after this, but I'm going to tell you, no matter what, we go forward making Travis proud and living a life worthy of his sacrifice and essentially continuing his service. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but we all committed in that room that day to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the biggest things for me was, you know, when you, when you lose someone and, you know, right away, there's everyone's there and the house is filled and there, and it's distractionary, you know, there's so many people around. And for me, the saddest moment was thinking when that funeral was over, everyone else went back to their lives, their lives went on, they continued. And I remember my neighbor walking out of the house with a bag of trash after the the funeral and the reception afterwards. And I was like, that's it, you know, and, and now we've got to figure out what, what happens next. Um, my parents, friends had set up a, um, in lieu of flowers, donate to the first Lieutenant Travis Manning Memorial fund. And so we found ourselves a couple weeks after his death with 
several hundred thousand dollars in a bank account. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Huge. And so we were kind of like, well, what, what do we do now? Right. What do we do with this? Travis wasn't married, had no dependents. And it was actually my mom who said, we're going to, this is the way that we're going to continue his service. So she started the Travis Manning Foundation. And originally we were granting other nonprofits uh, across the country that we saw doing innovative work with uh, veterans. We were granting them money. And then we started to really dial down on what we brought to the community and what we thought we could do to amplify um, uh, the veterans message out there. And so, you know, we are here today in 2019. We've been a 501c3 for about 11 years now. Um, we operate with eight regional offices across the country and um, have close to 60 people working for us and engage hundreds of thousands of people a year. And it's all, and all of our programs are led by veterans, which is a little bit of a flip in a traditional uh, VSO. Mm -hmm. I love it. And we have someone close that has worked for y'all at the Travis Manion Foundation, Cindy O.G. Axelson. Yeah. Yeah. She's one of our favorite people. So yes, yeah, Cindy was with us on our San Diego team and yeah. um, she's awesome. Awesome to work with. Yeah. And um, Albie, is it Albie? Yes. Uh, yeah. Was running like, a, I don't know, like across America or across something. The country. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, was in Cypress, Texas, which is our next town over. And we sponsored him and his running partners uh, for a couple of states, I think, for hotel rooms and stuff. And we met him out in Cyprus and cheered him on to for his little kickoff. <laughs> All right, guys, I've never hated anyone before, but Steven Singer, man, he's making us record this ad, and he's this guy in Philly you might have heard about. If you've been to Philly, you may have seen billboards or heard him on the radio, but I, I can't stand him. Yeah, Steven Singer, he is prideful on being the most hated jeweler in America, and that's because the other jewelers just can't stand him, and we all know why, because he has the best Valentine's gift ever. Well, that's a pretty big claim. I mean, I'm sure you've given some pretty incredible Valentine's Day gifts in your time. Yes, yeah, so I, I I I have to come up with some original Valentine's gifts for my wife because it's a uh, it's a few days long. Valentine's Day and her birthday that's one big thing. So you put me and that dude together, we come up with some pretty good Valentine's gifts. All right, well tell them more about it. I'm sure we can use all the help we can get. All right, we got a real long term American Beauty rose, lavishly and deeply dipped in pure 24 karat gold. It lasts forever. You heard that, and they start at just 59 bucks. Yeah, his beautiful Valentine's Day red rose is not going to wilt or die like most flowers you're going to buy from the store. It doesn't even need water. It's the number one gift women want, something unique, special, it'll last forever, which means if you don't want to get her a Valentine's gift, no, I'm just kidding. They come with your own personalized love note, and they actually come in Steven's signature gift box shipped for free, and again, they're just $59. Yeah, that, that's probably the reason why you're going to wind up hating that dude because you can't. Is it is like one gift for every Valentine's Day because it lasts forever? So can can we regift it? Is it going to be better? We, have, we know actually we have to go back and buy another one of those roses for every Valentine's Day. That's why you wind up hating the dude because it's so good every get... freaking year. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steven. Singer. Thanks, Steven. Appreciate it. So go now to IHateStevenSinger.com and see what we're talking about. That's IHateStevenSinger.com. Steven Singer Jewelers. This is a gift that she will cherish forever. That's IHateStevenSinger.com. story because you know so that was like the second or third time he's run across the country yeah. but originally Albie came to us um he kind of cold called the office and said I have this idea that um that I, I want to present to you guys and he was you know he was struggling as an individual didn't really know what he wanted to do with his life and he wanted to support the veteran community and he came to us with an idea this was very early on. He said, I'm going to run across the country, bring awareness to veterans and mm -hmm. and the military community. And, you know, I just want your blessing for it to go, you know, my proceeds to go to TMF. And we, you know, we said, OK, yeah, that sounds good. So we kind of followed his journey and um, it was incredible. It was him and his sister in like in a, in a suburban just <laughs> and, I mean, they're eating meals out of gas stations and he finishes the um 
he finishes the race and he gets a tattoo on his forearm. I think it's like 3,025, the mileage that he did. And then he came back um, and he said, you know, I'd love to work for you guys now. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess we have to hire you. I mean, you just ran across the country. Right? So you run back. He's well, yeah. And, yeah. He's one of our most incredible. Um, he's one of our most incredible uh, employees at TMF. He's just infectious. His um, attitude. Yeah. And he's really how he gets cool. out there. Yeah. That's awesome. And you do programs. I've seen like where you take um, Gold Star families on these um, kind of empowerment type trips. Yeah, so we do um, expeditions. Yes. Um, so and and so our approach to how we work with the survivor community is a little bit different. Um, we and and it kind of goes back to that conversation in the bedroom with my dad, where my dad said, "Like we are going to continue Travis's service." That's mm-hmm. and so we felt like the Travis Manion Foundation gave us the opportunity to continue his legacy. And we want to give that to all gold star family members. So instead of saying, you know, we want to bring you together and, and we're just going to share and grieve together. Our approach is you want to honor your loved one. Well, we're going to make you do some pretty crazy things. So Mm -hmm. you want to honor your loved one. We're going to take you to Guatemala and you're going to build a house for a homeless family. Uh, We're going to take you to New Mexico and you're going to do um, home improvements for Vietnam veterans on the Navajo Nation there. And so we do that close to 10 times a year. We do survivor expeditions. I'm actually heading out in one in January um, to Puerto Rico. Um, but it's a beautiful thing to be able to have the community together um, and share our loved ones' stories and feel that kinship, but also know that we're giving back in their names. And I think we found that that serving others is such an important component to working through your loss. Well, you just tossed him right into Travis's life. I mean, Marines are they're war fighters. Make no, that's that's set in stone. That's all they do. That's what, yeah. And then they go on adventures around the world, defending people from those battles and yeah. putting taking the, the 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 gold stars and putting them in that realm and sending them off on those adventures. I mean, building a house in Guatemala or places where we don't have the, the local hardware store is, is a battle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, y'all wouldn't be there. That well, kind of deal. And it's their service. It's their sense of service. I love that. Like, you're serving them by having them serve others. Right. And it just, it makes sense. I mean, it's an honorable thing to have that, that tapped inside of you to serve, throw on the uniform and be represented by your, by your clan kind of deal. So it's... That's kind of the best way I've heard of honoring the their legacy is by actually living their life and yep. in that that moment. That's I love that. Deep. I don't know if that made sense, but it's I mean it, it's it's awesome. <laughs> so we also saw that you uh, received the president's lifetime achievement award for service. Can you tell us what that was like? Sure. I mean, you know, that is. It, I I always say that's one of the things that I'm most proud of because it was my commitment to service after Travis left, um, after Travis was killed. And it was, you know, um, to, to know that I have put in the hours of giving back to my community, um, and to be honored in that way, um, is it's, it's an incredible honor. And, um, I think again, it speaks to, I think it speaks to the larger community. I always say, and one of the reasons we wrote this book, you know, if you think outside of this community, I, you guys know so many incredible Gold Star families, but the general population right now, when you think about a Gold Star family member, the image that you have of them is a, a young widow standing by a coffin with a folded flag. And no one ever tells the story about what happens when they put that folded flag up on the shelf in their house, what they go on to do. And, um, you know, my co-author, Amy Looney Heffernan, uh, one of the first things she did was climb to the top of Montu Picchu with a bunch of seal widows. And so no one tells those stories. And it was important for us to, you know, the book is sad in that it tells our stories of loss, but we also hope that it comes across as hopeful and shows the strength and resilience of of the men and women uh, who are left behind after their loved ones have, have been lost. Yeah, I think it does that. Oh, that's the most powerful thing. You're, you're not, I mean, not left behind, you're left in the game. And that image of y'all standing in front of that coffin with that flag is kind of like, that's the, that's those Marines. That's the, the guys who pay that ultimate sacrifice. That was their cape. 
and they just gave that to y'all. So now you, that's the blanket of freedom that you sleep under. And I go spread that with everybody else. And it's, it's, it's a baptism in fire. I mean, you got the watch time. Yeah. And I'm, this is the best thing about it. Those alf, the guys running out there as hard charging uh, warfighters. Who do you think tames us, right? <laughs> it's our women and, and our, our family members. You are one of those guys. <laughs> uh, but, uh, when you were talking about what you're doing now and how far you've taken it all the way up to getting that citation, I, I thought back when you were a kid and obviously I was thinking about my daughter because she, I don't want, she's not flighty. She's just kind of whatever she's in, right, we're, whatever kind of realm we're in right now hasn't caught her attention. Mm-hmm. So that's why she's been tapped. And that's why you were tapped at a young age with that, that kind of attitude because it's not time for you yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think so. And you know, I mean, one of the things that I always say, and I think that, if there's anything I regret, it's that I wasn't this version of myself when Travis was alive. And so I had to think back, like, what what could I have done? What was that kind of wake up call for me um, that I could have had before his death? You know, a lot of the things that I do now, um, I, I think Travis probably wouldn't believe it. You know, I was a I was a young mother of one married to a surfer from New Jersey and I owned a men's and women's clothes. I loved it. And that was my life. I lived in a, I lived in an, a small Island in New Jersey and um, you know, that's, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I wasn't driven to, to do more. I wasn't driven to look at the larger concept of what role that I played in our society. And, um, and so you know, some of the things we talk about in the book is this idea of like, don't wait, don't wait until you get that knock on the door to be the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, those are, that's a lot of like the, the, the keys and the takeaways that we, we all talk about because Amy, Heather and I, we all kind of feel that way, um, in, in to some degree. Well, that's kind of a testament to your family and, and cause there was two of you. And Travis stepped in, being older, and covered that line. So you could go do whatever it is you wanted because there was one of y'all on the line. And then yeah. when he, when he, you were saying what that, what was that key? If you could have found it earlier, you couldn't have. Really, yeah. I mean, it had to take one of y'all getting pulled out of the game for the other one to engage. It goes back to when you were young. It just wasn't time. I mean, you were kind of following that second, that that second. You had two choices, that two paths, right? You had the one that you were doing it because your brother was covering down on it. And the minute they stepped him out, you know, guys like eight. Hey, Need to put that chest piece back in. There's one standing by, and that was you. And I, I like that way to look at it. For sure. <laughs> that's, that's the best version I've heard of how you can frame that out. So a lot of our listeners ask us what what's the best way that a civilian, someone that's not you know doesn't have someone in the military, they they don't really have a connection, but they respect the military a lot and respect veterans and Gold Star families. How can they serve the community? What would your advice to them be? You know, the cool thing about um, the Travis Manion Foundation is that, like I said, our community is made up, like our programs are run by veterans, but our membership base is largely civilians. And we, we call them our inspired civilians, but we want to make sure that we are bridging. I know it's been overused, but it still exists. There is a civilian military divide and we need to make sure that we don't have to drive everyone to a um, uh, to to serve in the military, but we do need to drive people to be servant leaders in their own backyards. And we have a ton of engagement opportunities throughout the year. I saw you were posting today, Melanie, about um, Reese Across America, mm-hmm. and we've partnered with them too. And you know, we're right now we're doing a huge campaign just to get everyone out there to be a part of this to take one wreath and and stick it at a gravestone and not just stick it there, but read that name and go home and Google that story and, and learn about the, the person that you just placed that wreath in front of. But we just finished up a, uh, a month long campaign called Op Legacy. And these are service projects that we execute all across the country. We call them Operation Legacy because each service project is named in honor of a fallen hero. So we brought out thousands of individuals, all civilians, to serve and and learn the stories of our our loved ones who have gone before us. But I think it's opportunities like that and just getting the message out there that there are a ton of ways to serve 
and be involved in this community. And I don't think you have to look too far. If they're listening to your podcast, they don't have to look too far to find it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a great way of, of saying that. I, you said I did that to you earlier. You just put one on me. I, this country is so magnificent. I mean, you could grab an iPhone, look at a picture and touch it and it'll show up to the door. And it's almost one of those, there's been a gap between from the Vietnam veterans all the way up to us that while we were out there fighting those wars, the country, we were, you know, the military did such a good job that it, it, it produced an environment to where that that's capable. And now there's not much that we don't have that, I mean, that besides technology and its advancement that, that you can go without, I mean, we don't have, we have everything almost. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable. And the people that provided the cover for that, now y'all are going back and recognizing them. And that's, I never thought about it like that, but it's true. We've been so busy building this country into how great it is. Now it's time to, we're in that idle spot. You know, we're in an idle spot when the biggest thing people are complaining about is the weather. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Like on the flow, what's most people worried about? And number like number three is weather. I'm like, oh, okay, things are great. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's a perfect way to get in there and, and, and remember those those guys who, who came before us and laid the groundwork for that to happen. Yeah, we love what you're doing with the foundation. Um, can you tell us a little more about your experience with the book, how it's been received? It's been going really well. Um, we were able to do a great um, national kickoff, uh, my, th my two co-authors and I. So we got some great um, uh, national media attention in the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's selling really well. And I think the reason for that is I say, you know, we're, we wrote this story, um, not just as a military story. We wrote this story because this story responds uh, to everyone. Um, we all received a knock at the door that was a literal knock telling us that the person we loved most was taken away from us. But every single one of us, every single one of us that exists, has a knock at the door. And it may come in the form of a literal knock like we got, but it can also come in the form of a metaphorical knock. I talk about the book um, after five years after Travis was killed, I got another knock at the door when my mom was diagnosed with cancer. Um, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer and they gave her eight months to live. And unfortunately she succumbed to that cancer after eight months. And, and that was almost more difficult for me to process. And that's when I actually really started to have a struggled a lot. I, um, I didn't really, I don't want to say didn't grieve properly, but I, when Travis was killed, I just, I just went, I set goals. It was like foundation, boom, I'm going to run a marathon, boom, I'm going to do that. You know, it was setting these goals to just kind of exist and feel like I was doing something purposeful, which I was, but after my mom passed away, I really had to slow things down. I started to suffer with some anxiety and depression. Um, and I, I didn't understand why it was now that it was happening. And so that's when I had to be very intentional about how I was going to work through um, my grief. And so, um, you know, whether the loss comes from the death of a loved one or the implosion of a, uh, a marriage, um, the loss of a career. I mean, we all have these knocks in our lives. And um, the, the, the biggest thing we say is like, it's not about so much about the knock itself, but it's about how you're going to respond to that knock. And um, unfortunately, we've, we've had to respond to big knocks in our life. And um, we hope this book can be used to, to help others when they, uh, when they get the knocks themselves. That, that same thing kind of happened to, to us as well this year. My, my mother was diagnosed with cancer as well. And uh, before that, I, we had the situation that I was in as well. And you're right. It's kind of like when you went through that part of it, we came back and, and, you, and you ran as fast as you could, doing as much as you could for everybody around you. To, to And then that happens, right? Your mom gets diagnosed with cancer. It's kind of like, like the Lord's way of saying, hey, all right, you, you did what you're supposed to do. Now I need to concentrate on your family. Slow back down, and we're going to start at the beginning with mom. I mean, that's where you go back to, right? Mom, it all started right there. And it's easy to look at that as a bad thing because we've, we, we work so hard to make ourselves not invulnerable but tough to the, to the environment around us. And the one place you're not looking is base camp. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's like, I know that's secure. I'm going to get out of here and, and go 
when you start doing the charities and everything that you were doing, that's that's how you know that your base is set. And um, every now and again, he'll mess around in there to keep keep you grounded at home uh, with the family, obviously with kids or something. Something that wasn't getting our attention. And uh, it took me a while to figure that one out too. But ultimately, that's how you have to look at it. It's We're set down here for a reason. And as we're running through that gauntlet we call life, always remember where you where you start out every morning and focus on that so it's yeah, that's, that's kind of hard lesson to learn that way right <laughs> i mean that's yeah. what they have to do to us to, to to do to slow us down but i mean there's a purpose in everything yeah. it's very hard and i'm so sorry about your mom Maybe yeah, i don't even is... think that i mean i i still hadn't railed from the street I, I, that because when that hits you that's a different type of shock mm-hmm. yeah Oh, absolutely. I think I'm still in shock. <laughs> I just, I, I just couldn't even uh, fathom that being a, a thing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and it's you know, for me, it was after losing Travis. You know, um, Brendan Looney, who Amy Looney Heffernan wrote about her husband, but you know, Brendan and Travis were best friends. They um, were roommates at the Naval Academy, and Brendan was actually one of the individuals that was there for my family in a big way after Travis was killed. Um, And so to hear about his loss three years later, when we learned that he had been killed, I, I was like, I was mad at God. Mm -hmm. I I could not believe that. I, I say it was like lightning struck twice. And how does that happen? And, um, it was, it was a terrible time. Um, and then two years later, my mom gets sick. It, it, it just, it was this snowball effect of, I just can't believe that, that things like this keep happening. But I think, you know, Marcus, you're right. It's, you know, a lot of times you just have to, you have to take a step back and realize that none of us are invincible. Um, we are going to have things that, that hit us hard. And, um, while we have to keep moving forward, we also have to, take a step back sometimes and just process what's happening in our lives. Mm-hmm, for sure. My gosh. It's so difficult to do that too. When you have, when you've committed yourself to everybody around you, I mean, yeah. there's a difference between having friends on the phone. You're, you can put your phone down and it's, if, if you lose that thing, it ain't no big deal. But when you lose that connection with somebody who's, who's close with you, it's, it's tough. Absolutely. So we also want to promote you for the Team Never Quit speakers. Yeah. Um, we haven't booked you yet, but we are heavily pushing you. And we want our listeners out there, if you're looking for a speaker, you've heard Ryan today. And we would love um, for you to contact. Actually, Teresa's in the room listening to you right now. Oh, great. Yeah. So um, we really hope that you have a successful go at doing the speaking and with your book and is there anything else that we can help promote that you've got going on whether it's the foundation or for yourself and do you still have your retail stores I don't so I actually um I closed uh my retail stores um I opened that location I signed the lease the day Travis was killed Mm -hmm. so I signed that lease and then I ran the store until September um, so about six months and then I, I closed it. I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and I closed my other location because really it brought me no sense of purpose, frankly. Mm-hmm. I, I felt no purpose folding designer jeans anymore. Um, and so I went from there. I thought, oh, I have to serve, you know, that, that my initial thought was I've got to serve somehow. So I went to work for the government. I found out that that did not bring me. Any <laughs> <other further. laughs> How did that go? <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, I worked for the government for about two years. And then by that point, the Travis Manning foundation had grown pretty exponentially. And so we were in a place where I could actually join and make that, uh, my full-time endeavor. So I've been running the organization now for, for several years. And, um, you know, again, it's all about finding purpose, Mm -hmm. finding purpose in your life and, and what you can do and, and, Every day I wake up so blessed at the opportunity uh, to carry on Travis's legacy and the legacy of all of the men and women who have given their lives in service to this country. That's 
the irony of that you were signing that lease that would take the day that Travis passed away was it's kind of like when you sign up for the military because ultimately when that happened you started like okay I got to serve I got to serve so what Travis just slid that military contract of service right underneath that that lease you were signing and you signed that it's just like signing up for the military yeah. you're wondering if you did that that's when it was and that voice and that that drive I mean that's you know, Travis's spirit jumped right over there beside you they said your wingman he was always there for you so that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that story. And we'll yeah. do everything we can to uh, to promote what you're trying to do. So how yeah. can people follow you and find you, uh, donate to the foundation? I am on um, Instagram at rmanion, Twitter at rmanion, Facebook at Ryan Mannion. Um, you can go to... Uh, you can go to my website, ryanmannion.com. Um, You'll find out more information about you know, the different uh, speaking uh, opportunities that I've had the opportunity to do, um, more information about the book. And then you can go to travismanion.org and learn more about the Travis Manion Foundation and how you can get involved in uh, your community. We are across the country and there's ways for you to get involved no matter where you are. Well, whenever you come to Houston, let us know. We'll treat you to dinner. We're, we've got a great office down in Houston. We're with the Combined Arms Center yep. there. I don't know if you guys have ever been there. Yeah. Um, but we've got a great – and, you know, one of the things we have in Houston, too, so we do the 9-11 Heroes Run is a big awareness campaign for us. We execute about 95K runs in the month of September. Oh, my gosh. And our largest run is actually in Houston. And yeah, it's put on the, well, that's super duper. Oh, why does everybody have to do a run? Yeah, I we mean don't that's like the one running. thing we don't like to do in the military. <laughs> is that why we do it? It's because it's a, well, I mean, come on, I'll, I'll pass out water or something, man. I, <laughs> we say it's a Travis. I, I love you, brother, man. But you know, <laughs> yeah, you could be on the side holding the flag. You yeah. know? It's about, <laughs> yeah. it's about to come down <laughs> um, but it's a but it's a great community down there. We love it. You know, we've. We're um, we're good friends with uh, Tara and Dan Crenshaw, and they've been great supporters to us in in the Houston area as well. So next time I get down, I'll definitely um, hit you guys up to get together for sure. Well, Tara's great, the yeah. one that um, I saw her. She did the run this year and was promoting it really big. We love oh, yeah. Tara and Dan. Yeah, we'll get a pirate Dan out there and shove him into trees on that side. He can't see out of. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Ryan, for taking your time. Yeah, Ryan, with thanks, us. man. We love you guys. God bless you. Thank you so much. Great yes. to talk to you. You too. Bye. We are sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. It is really hard to find a good bank, especially one that puts its members first. I've gone through a ton of banks when I was young. I had a few. I just didn't know what I was doing back then, probably, but you know, whatever. But it's hard to find a bank that you really can care about. And the guys over at Navy Federal Credit Union, they, they've got something cool going on. And did you know that you didn't have to actually serve in the Navy to join Navy Federal Credit Union? I did not know that part, actually. I didn't either. But I, I do know that they take care of the veterans. It's like a big deal when you get in there. If you're an active duty service member, veteran, DOD, civilian, military, family member, you can actually still join Navy Federal, which means if you've served in any branch of the military, it doesn't have to be the Navy, it could be Army, it could be the Marines, it could be the Coast Guard, it could be the Air Force, you can still join their bank, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it takes about less than 10 minutes to become a member. That's fast. It takes a lot longer to go down to any other bank and get a new account set up. So, you know, these guys put their members first by helping them save money, make money, enjoy peace of mind and security through personalized, around-the-clock service. And these guys are actually federally insured by the NCUA, so you know your money's safe. Visit NavyFederal.org slash eligibility to see if you can join. Navy Federal Credit Union, our members are the mission. All right, guys, it's time for a listener story. And today's listener story is from Connor. Connor writes, fight with heart. Before I share my story, I would like to thank you guys for your service and all that you do. I'm usually a pretty private person, but I've thought about sharing my story for a while. It took someone I knew to point out to me all that I've gone through to finally convince me to share this story. My never quit story begins when I was born in the middle of a cold Michigan winter. As soon as I was born, the doctors knew there was something very wrong with me. I wasn't crying, and more importantly, I was blue. My mother was allowed to hold me for a few seconds before I was whisked away to the natal intensive care unit. After what must have seemed like years for my parents, the doctors came back and told them that I was born with a very rare heart condition called transposition of the great arteries. This condition causes the aorta to pump oxygenated blood to the heart, and the pulmonary artery to pump deoxygenated blood to the rest of the body. In simpler terms, my heart wasn't pumping the right blood to the right places, and because of this, my body was starving for oxygen. After this was explained to my parents, they were told that I needed to be operated on if I wanted any chance of survival. 
However, since the procedure was relatively new, only a few hospitals in the country offered it. My parents chose to send me to the University of Michigan for my surgery because they were the best at this complicated procedure. I was originally supposed to take a helicopter over to Ann Arbor, but due to a blizzard, we were forced to take an ambulance instead. The surgery went great, and at 17 years old, I am now living a healthy and active life. I play varsity tennis for my high school, as well as run on the track team, and I have dreams of becoming a federal agent so I can serve this great nation in my own way. I also hope to start training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu soon. Most people who undergo the procedure I had need at least one corrective surgery. I haven't, and hopefully never will. While this won't be my only never-quit story, it is certainly the most important. Every other challenge I have faced down, I have attacked with the mindset of, I cheated death as a newborn. What can't I do? I would like to thank all of you again for your service and giving others the ability to share their story. Man, we've had to deal with that heart condition crisis in our family. It's tough. If you're one of the rare cases that's been tapped with that, it's just kind of like the brakes have been put on you in the beginning to to slow you down so you can realize what you are. And only you can hold yourself back. Now, when they, when, just when they go in there and they work on that, or if, as you go through life every day, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. And the biggest fuel for that is, is kind of the mindset. You can have that defeatist mindset and, and always say, hey, the, you know, what I've been tapped with is, is, is terrible and it's going to hold me back because that's the easy way to do it. But if you actually load that powerful fuel in there, that positive attitude that you have, man, it, it, it blows the brakes off of that. And you shotgun past any disability that you think you might have. So good on you, brother. Thanks for writing in and telling us that story. Connor, you've got an awesome outlook. Keep fighting, and we're going to pray for you that you just do great things with your life. Yeah, and you're only 17, man. You've got you've got a lot of life ahead, so keep that attitude. Just the fact that you already have the, the mentality of never quitting, that's super awesome. So just keep at it. Thanks, Connor, for writing in. If you want to share your story with us, head over to teamneverquit.com slash podcast. Share your story by clicking the button at the top of the menu that says share your story, and we'd love to read your stories on the show. We've got tons of stories on the website that you can read, you can relate to. It's a really great way for us as a community to connect. We are sponsored by the audiobook edition of Leadership Strategy and Tactics, written and read by Jocko Willink. Look, I served, uh, I wasn't in the platoon with Jocko, but I, I was overseas with him and every, everywhere else, including after the teams. And I mean, it, there's some of our leaders, when you hear their name, and when it comes to tactics and leadership, and, and just kind of, it's hard to be the boss and be, still be one of the guys. That you. If you if you come across one of them dudes, that means they have that they're the alpha bull. They have the respect to everything around them, and they can still go in and kind of you know hang out with the boys. But then when it comes to business time, man, there's a line, and, and there is a technique to that, and he can teach you. I've seen him do it. Yeah, he did it with me. So I mean, he's he's good at what he does. And Jocko's a number one New York Times bestselling co-author of Extreme Ownership and a former Navy SEAL, as Marcus mentioned. Leadership strategy and tactics is a direct practical how-to leadership guide that anyone can instantly put to use, which is pretty cool. Yeah, you can listen to the audio book. It's read by Jocko himself. It gives you, I mean, it coaches you through the whole thing. So if you're looking for an audio book on leadership strategies and tactics written by a guy who actually knows what he's doing, he's a good friend of mine, a uh, great friend, actually. I love him to death. Jocko Willing. Now, wherever audio books are sold, you can get it. That's right. Buy the audiobook of leadership strategy and tactics written and read by Jocko Willink now wherever audio books are sold. Great show, bud. Ryan, thank you again for coming on here and doing that. I I, uh, I, I learned a lot from you and, and what you have had been through I, and how relative it was to a lot of the things that, that uh, Melly and I have gone through in the past as well. So keep charging, keep fighting, and uh, never quit. It just goes to show it doesn't matter where you're from, where you're at, or, or what your gender is, or what your color is, that we all kind of step in some of those adversities and step them out, stepping out of them changes your life for the better. Thank you for being a part of this and, and going through your struggle and coming out for the better on the other side. Welcome to the team. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. We really admire your work and how you've carried on your brother's legacy and keep doing what you're doing. You guys make sure to check out her book, The Knock at the Door. It's pretty much anywhere you can buy a book. Check out the foundation, travismanion.org, and uh, you can follow her on social media. She's got a lot of great things going on. And um, if you guys like this show, if you like the episode, make sure to share it with a friend. That's how this show grows. That's how we continue to inspire others to never quit is by you guys sharing the show, you guys subscribing. If you want to do that, you can just head over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, any other major player, and you can subscribe to the show. And um, if you'd like to follow us on social media, you can do that at team underscore never quit 
We love you guys. Thanks for coming back every single week. This is so much fun to do this, and uh, we can't thank you guys enough.